So I'd like to welcome everybody back to a couple more presentations. And I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Jake Wegman. I met Jake out in Boston a few years ago, and I glommed right on to him because as much as we geeked, about, geeked out about accessory dwelling units in Cascadia, I had not yet met somebody who geeked out on them all across the country. He studied these things. He has um, a background in affordable housing, as I do as well. And, and I knew that we had to lure him out here to speak, so we did that. Um, Jake is an assistant professor in the Community and Regional Planning Program at the University of Texas at Austin, where he's taught since 2014. Before UT Austin, he received a PhD at UC Berkeley, another little hotbed for ADUs. His research lies at the intersection of housing affordability, housing supply, with a special focus on market rate housing production and land use. Before entering academia, Jake spent six years working for four and nonprofit affordable housing developers in Denver and San Francisco. He's a leading researcher in the field, a field that unfortunately has maybe about a dozen people in the country right now. Most of them are here today. And I'd love to have you guys help me welcome Jake to speak. Thank you. A former dean of uh, where I teach used to say that the hardest part of his job is interrupting really interesting conversations. So uh, I'm sorry to do that, but and, and it really was not difficult to lure me here at all because it is really just such an honor to be here in the uh, ADU capital of America. And thank you so much for the generous introduction, Eli. Um, you know, the rest of us around the country, we really look up to you here in Portland, whether it's urban growth boundaries or wooden high rises or uh, protected bike lanes. Um, you kind of make the rest of us look bad, but I think at the end, that's a good thing because we're, we're having to up our game to keep up with you. And I'm, I'm really grateful to the Build Small Coalition for the chance to, to talk to you today. I'm just a little upset with them for having me go after Harriet Tregoning, which is a seriously tough act to follow. But uh, what I'm going to try to do here this morning is uh, just offer a few thoughts on where I think our, our ADU movement is, where it stands. And I think, as I see it, there's some really good news. You've been hearing about a lot of it. I think there's a little bit of bad news, too, so I'll go over that. And then I'll offer a few thoughts on where I think we all need to go over the next five to 10 years. And some of what I'm going to say, you'll have heard traces of it um, in, in what you heard so far this morning. But before I do that, um, I'm going to go back into the past just a little bit. Uh, we, we've already heard that ADUs are actually nothing new under the sun. They're as deeply rooted in America as baseball and many other things that we all love. And um, even, the, even if they're sometimes talked about as though they're this newfangled exotic thing, but really they're not. But I'm actually going to go back just a little more recently to the 80s. Um, and uh, at that time, there was a lot of concern about the aging of the population. Would homeowners be able to stay in their single family houses as they aged? And you can see this was reflected in the pop culture at the time. Would they be able to as they became more frail? Would they be able to maintain their homes? And from this set of questions came a movement of sorts, a kind of proto-ADU movement to promote the ADU as a solution to a lot of this. And this movement was a little different. It, it talked about the suburbs a lot. Um, here's an early article by Deborah Howe, then at Portland State. So see, even back then, Portland was a real pioneer in this area. Um, in 1985, there was even a full book-length treatment of, of, of this by uh, Martin Gowen called Accessory Apartments and Single-Family Housing. And now Cole Peterson is going to bring this into the 21st century. Um, and from all this came some real, some, some real action. There, uh, there was a whole raft of state programs. I had no idea about this until I started doing some background research. I had just assumed that this was all new, our focus on ADUs. But these state programs, they sought to provide low or no interest loans to elderly homeowners 
to allow them to carve ADUs out of their existing houses so they could bring in some rental income, so they could have a on-site helper to, to help them. The housing scholars Joan and Nicholas Ritzinas wrote this article in 1991 that kind of looked back on these efforts and assessed them. And their conclusion uh, was, unfortunately, by and large, they just didn't work. Um, the state programs just barely got any takers at all. Um, and uh, so ADUs had had a little bit of a moment, but um, Sadly, it was an old idea that was maybe just a little bit too far ahead of its time, paradoxical as that sounds. But um, so what was the lesson from this? What, what, can we, what can we take from this that's useful to us now? Well, um, I'd point to a couple of things. First, building an ADU, it might seem from the outside, from the big picture, like a slam dunk. In the 1980s, just like now, creating an ADU, it made sense both from the supply side, it, it, it certainly met some needs that homeowners had. And from the demand side, there were lots of people then as now who needed cheap rental housing to, to, to live in and on, on quiet streets. The costs to do this were low. But the thing is, the big picture feasibility, that wasn't enough. The little picture has to work, too. And, and we've already been hearing about that a lot this morning. It's, it's not just how much it costs and how much is it going to rent for. It's also who's going to be building it. Do they know how to do it? Do they even know that the option exists? And um, can they get a loan to do it? Are they prepared to have their home turn into a construction site? Are they ready to take on debt? Are they ready to be landlords? So I think at the time, those are the questions that, that got left out. So I think we all need to put our collective heads together and make sure we don't do the same thing today. So, if we fast forward to the present day, about a quarter century, where do we stand? As I see it, there's, there's some, some really good news, but there's also some bad news. The good news about the bad news is I think it's still early enough. I think we can turn things around. But let's just start with the unambiguously good news. Um, I mean, big picture, I think we've, we've just turned a corner with ADUs. I, just, I don't think they're going to fade into the woodwork again like they did with what I like to call the false dawn of ADUs in the 1980s. Um, housing affordability, it's just getting squeezed all around the country now. It's not just the traditional New York's and Washington DC's and San Francisco's. It's really a nationwide phenomenon. And producing housing is getting harder and more expensive, especially in and near urban cores at just the moment when city life is becoming sought after again. Um, so if you look at this graph, uh, this really shows what one journalist has called the great inversion in American cities, where people with large amounts of money and other forms of privilege are once again choosing to live in central cities in big numbers. So this is Atlanta. And uh, it may be a little hard to see, but with this graph, if it's above the line, that means that the per capita household income went up from 1990 to 2012, and it's showing it in terms of distance from downtown. So you can see this is Atlanta, uh, up to 10 miles out from downtown, average per capita household income went up. This is just this really fantastic research that Luke Jude from the University of Virginia did, putting all these graphs together for cities around the country. Here's Houston, same thing, it's seven miles out. Um, and I could show you dozens more. So this really is just going on across the board. Uh, now, I said good news. This is definitely not good news if you're someone who's struggling with, with housing costs in a city. But for our purposes, since ADUs are pretty much the cheapest way you could possibly add a housing unit in an infill setting, I think for our purposes, it is it, it, it means that ADUs are just interested in them. I, like I said, I just, I just don't think it's going to go away. So not everywhere, not, maybe not even most places, but the, the regulatory barriers really are coming down in, in a few places like you've been hearing. Um, you know, there's nothing like a spectacular success story like Portland to uh, get people excited around the country. And I, I'm not going to belabor the Portland story because you heard it in great detail, but I think the the thing that's so powerful to me about what the Portland people did is 
they just, they went for it, right? They didn't tinker around. They, they just, they don't have an owner occupancy requirement. Um, in 2004, if, if, if I, you know, understood Eli's timeline correctly, you know, they didn't just lift parking requirements near a transit station or in a commercial corridor. They just ditched them citywide. Um, I think there's, again, a lesson for the rest of us there. Take risks to be bold. Take the plunge and see what happens. Sometimes action can be its own reward. And uh, you know, you, you saw the, numer the, the numerical consequences of this. And now, here's a really fantastic story. Uh, very recently, uh, about a year ago, if I recall correctly, California, the state of California passed a raft of three bills that really um, affect what, they really begin to dismantle some of the barriers that local jurisdictions are always putting up around ADUs. And here's the response. This is a graph put together by uh, Jason Neville, who's here today with us, uh, that he, he dug into all the, the data from LA and, and found this historical pattern. Just look at liftoff being achieved here right after the state legislation occurs. So I, th I think this is very promising. And I think we're not just going to have to point to the Portland story in the coming years. And it's not just about numbers, right? ADUs are also in many ways becoming more mainstream. You know you're becoming mainstream when one of the nation's largest suburban production home builders adds an ADU-like option to one of its uh, models. Now, to be fair, the next gen, as, the, as they call their ADU-like option, it's really only marketed towards homeowners interested in multi-generational living. It's not really intended to be rented to strangers, and I would imagine in a lot of places where this home is being built, that would probably not be allowed. But even so, the mainstreaming of extended family living as a, as a you know, common accepted concept, I think that's a huge step forward for, for our purposes. And then, dare I say it? Well, we heard it this morning. ADUs are becoming cool in, in, in some cases. Um, and you, know, you heard about the, the bike tours that the organizers of this uh, conference have have put on and other types of events. And that's just, that's a really big part of, of the story of what's happening. Um, tiny houses, you know, they're not exactly the same kind of animal as ADUs, but they probably are the same genus, if not the same species, right? And um, well, they've got their own TV show now. So something's in the air. And I do think that that bodes well for ADUs. And again, I just, I don't think they're gonna go away again. So that's the good news, but I'm sorry, I do have to talk a little bit about some bad news. Um, so consider the case of Metropolitan Denver. Uh, as my colleagues, Kerry McCarowitz and Alex Schaffrin have written in, uh, yeah, I know, I'm gonna move on in a second. Um, not talking about tiny houses right now, but they analyzed what has happened in the Denver metropolitan area. And so far they found 23 jurisdictions that have in some way eased restrictions or made ADUs possible. But the title of their paper is gonna be Permission Isn't Enough. So what they found is that despite all the hard work, all the political risk taking that was needed to make this happen in a lot of places, some places just haven't gotten any production at all. So it shows that sometimes just opening the floodgates on its own isn't enough. Um, now, some places have, but other places haven't. And then even in the, the hot marketplaces, like where we are now, Seattle or Austin, where opening the floodgates is enough, still some of us are starting to notice a, a kind of a troubling pattern in, uh, regarding who's building ADUs. Now, look at this map from Seattle. Um, the little black dots are internal ADUs, and then the, the bigger dots with uh, Colored dots are uh, external or, or uh, detached ADUs. And you can see a lot of production, especially in the northern and central parts of the city, and not a whole lot in the south. Now, if you know Seattle, the south of the city is where there's a big concentration of neighborhoods that are still relatively, I, I, I put air quotes around relatively, affordable, but that are squarely in the path of gentrification. I mean, we know what's gonna happen next. 
And if we want homeowners, especially homeowners of color, many of whom are struggling to ha hang on in Seattle, we would hope for a lot of ADU production in exactly these places as an anti-displacement uh, approach, but it's just, it's really just not happening a whole lot there. Let me give you another example. Um, about a year ago, I joined the board of the Austin Community Design and Development Center, or ACDDC. ACDDC was founded back in 2006, and since then it's played a leading role in something called the Alley Flat Initiative now for over a decade. And the idea behind this is that low-income homeowners, especially a lot of the long-standing African-American and Latino homeowners who hung on in, in East Austin through, uh, you know, of course, living through years of, of disinvestment, who put up with a whole lot of adversity, only to now risk being displaced altogether because they can't afford our, our sky-high property taxes in, taxes in, in, in Texas or because they can't afford maintenance on their homes. The idea was these homeowners would, would build an alley flat. And an alley flat, that's our uh, special brand at ACDDC. That's what we call an ADU that's green building certified and rent restricted for a low income renter. And the idea is that we, ACDDC, would help the homeowners build their alley flat, connect them with city programs that would reduce their costs, and then the completed alley flat would give them some financial muscle to be able to stay in their homes for the long haul. Well, it, it's been tough sledding, I'm here to tell you. Getting alley flats off the ground has taken a lot of effort, and it, as of yet, we just it hasn't scaled up quite yet. We've gotten seven of them done since 2008, now with 11 more on the way, so that's very encouraging. Uh, here's one of them. And you know where we've been able to build them, they've been extremely well received. So we're making progress, but still, what's, what's holding us back from, from scaling up? Well, we run into several, and I think these will be familiar to a lot of you in the room, especially those of you who've worked with low and moderate income homeowners on ADU projects. First of all, I think we have to hold two contradictory ideas in our heads at the same time, right? One is, on the one hand, it's absolutely true that an ADU is the cheapest way to add a new construction housing unit in a central city that, that we have. That's true. But on the other hand, cheap as it is, $150,000, let's say, that's a pretty daunting cost if you're a homeowner who's already struggling to pay their bills, right? You're, you're trying to pay your property taxes, your water bill, and if you're in that position taking on a, a whole bunch of debt to build something like an ADU, that's maybe if everything goes great, it's going to spin off a little bit of extra money each month you know, above and beyond the debt service and operating costs, you know, that may not sound like the best option if, if you're in that position. And of course, that's assuming that you can even get a loan. Now, we've heard about this a lot already this morning. Uh, let me show you some results from a study I worked on, that one that was led by Karen Chapel of UC Berkeley. We got survey responses from 414 homeowners who had recently succeeded in building ADUs uh, in, here in Portland or in Seattle, or in Vancouver, you know, the British Columbia one, not the one across the Columbia River. Um, and of those, 45% reported that they had relied on cash or some other personal resources to build their ADUs, and then another 40% borrowed against their home equity in some way, and only 4% of the respondents in our sample reported borrowing even a little bit in some way against the future expected value of the unbuilt ADU. So what does that mean? I think it's pretty clear. It's almost impossible to build an ADU if you don't either already have a high income that can allow you to qualify for the loan or a whole lot of home equity or some other form of pre-existing personal wealth to backstop the loan. So Martin Brown, one of the minds behind accessorydwellings.org, um, here in Portland has done some really incredible research on this. He showed, first of all, that federally backed mortgage products from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the FHA, which if you put those three together, they make up the vast lion's share of the mortgage market. They pretty much treat single family houses with ADUs differently than, say, a, a, a duplex. In a duplex, you can count 75% of the expected rental income as income towards qualifying for your mortgage. But in a single family house with an ADU, generally speaking, you just, you just can't. 
And that means that getting a construction loan to build an ADU is, is also going to be very difficult. So where, where, is, where does all this leave us? You know, legally permitted ADUs, they are on the rise and in certain places and for certain kinds of people. And, and that's, that's great. That's major progress. Even getting to where we are now has taken a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, you know, not least from a whole lot of you in this room. But the part that worries me is that if we stay on autopilot, Legally permitted ADUs could join fixie bikes and artisanal coffee as things that are undeniably wonderful on their own merits, but that really have become potent symbols of this big national problem that we have with unequal urban revival. So for the ADU to come to be seen by a lot of people who've been left out of this urban revival, if, those, if they view that, oh, this is something that's not for me, I think that's a problem. And I, I do think we have to put our collective heads together to, 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 to change that. And now, I also want to note that not doing anything is, is a choice, and it's a choice that has consequences. So about five years ago, I did my dissertation research on what some of those consequences are. And let me just kind of quickly show you a little bit of what I found. I looked at suburbs, uh, overwhelmingly Latino suburbs in southeast LA County. Um, these are areas that, over the last 50 years, they've been an opposite world from the rest of America. While city neighborhoods and close and suburbs throughout the country were emptying out, these ones were just gaining and gaining and gaining population as time went by. But uh, especially from the mid-'80s on, it didn't happen with a whole lot of knocking down single-family houses and replacing them with apartment buildings. Instead, it happened as homeowners added housing units to their properties by converting a garage into an apartment, by partitioning their houses into multiple units, by building a freestanding structure in the backyard of you know, varying quality levels. Um, <laughs> all of these we could call forms of ADUs, but for one thing, by and large, this was done without permits. This was, was done under the radar. So you know, now why? Why was this, you might ask? Well, you all know the answer. Elected officials you know, across the board refuse to change the zoning or exhibit flexibility with building codes to allow homeowners to add to their properties incrementally. And you can all imagine the rhetoric. Uh, this would lead to the ruin of neighborhoods or would reward rule breakers or would be unsafe and so on and so forth. But the thing about it is, is it happened anyway. People still built. They created their own utility hookups. They ran extension cords from the main house to the back house. They dug up their backyards to make unofficial connections to water and sewer lines. They asked the Postal Service for new mailboxes, and the Postal Service gave them new mailboxes. So I think it's possible to say this was a case of people being creative and resourceful to provide housing for themselves in the face of obstacle after obstacle. It's also equally possible and reasonable to say this has been problematic in a lot of ways. Most tragically, these sorts of informal housing arrangements have led to more than their fair share of fatal fires. Less dramatically, but perhaps uh, equally significant, in a lot of the areas that I looked at, the water and sewer systems were under intense strain and in some cases nearing collapse. So the utilities just hadn't collected the impact fees that they would have gotten under permitted development, the system development charges that, that were spoken about earlier today. So generally speaking, we're not used to thinking about these sorts of issues in the US. We think of this as something that happens you know, somewhere else in the world. But I can assure you this exists, at least in LA County and, and other parts of California too. And why I think this matters more broadly is I think what you might call informal housing LA style could be coming to a neighborhood near you in the near future. Uh, Freddie Mac just reported that when you look at the 97,000 rental housing units that they have nationwide that they financed twice between 2010 and 2016, which is a kind of a nice sample, there was a 60% plunge in the share of them that were affordable to very low income families. So when people run out of options to house themselves, I think we're going to start seeing a repeat of this LA scenario. Um, and you know, in LA, it's largely hidden, and I think this is going to be true across the country. I, was, I learned about it through conversations with homeowners, 
code enforcement officers and other people who had insights into this world that, again, mostly normally stays under the radar. Um, and sure, this thing already exists without a doubt um, here in Portland and other parts in the, of the country. You might have seen it in your own community, and I certainly have in Austin. It's just that it's a whole other ball game when it becomes pervasive, when it's the norm, when practically every lot across a vast swath has this, um, this, this sort of thing. Okay, so. I don't want to leave you with the impression that there's nothing we can do. In fact, I think there's a ton that we can do to get away from this autopilot scenario. We don't have to accept a future where ADUs are mostly thought of as being for white, upper-income homeowners in wealthy or gentrifying city neighborhoods. I think we can broaden our coalition, building on the things we're already doing. And I think it'll be rewarding. It'll make us stronger. And actually, I think it'll be what allows our ADU movement to do the things that we all wish for it to do. So here's my list of five suggestions and I think what we should work on the next five to 10 years. Now first, we already heard this from uh, Harriet Tregoning before me, but uh, working at the federal level, now you could say that, it, that it, it goes against a lot of what our movement has been about up until now. We've been grassroots, we've been scrappy. But the fact is that the federal government could do a whole lot to put wind in our sails. Uh, I've talked about the federal mortgage programs in fact, here, even here, there's some promising signs. Fannie Mae has unveiled something called the Home Ready Loan Program. It's brand new, and it's offered to either low-income borrowers or to homeowners who are in low-income census tracts. And crucially, it allows you to count that 75% of the ADU's rent as income, just like on a typical residential mortgage for a two to four unit property. So I guess my message here is, that's great, let's pay attention, let's promote it, let's encourage lenders to start using this program, let's get into the weeds and, and suggest ways for it to be improved. And there are probably a whole lot of other things that the federal government could do, and you just heard a really creative one before with uh, Harriet Tregoning's link of disaster resilience to potential, potentials for ADUs. And secondly, again, we, we, we've been hearing about this this morning, but I think we need to create intermediary. So what do I mean by an intermediary? I think that we need some new institutions that perform a variety of functions. I think we can't just throw homeowners to the wolves, right? Most homeowners, like you know, we heard um, towards the beginning, they're, they're not seasoned developers, Cole Peterson's point. And even for those of us who have plenty of money and education, and for whom English is our first language, we've, and those of us who've never experienced discrimination in City Hall, even for us, people like us, or me in my case, getting through the ADU building process can be really tough. In the study I was involved in of homeowners, and again, Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver, of the 414 homeowners we surveyed, 19% were just flat out turned down for a permit at one point. And then over a third had some major problem getting through the permitting process. And those are the ones who ultimately succeeded, right? So I think we have to get systematic about providing homeowners with help. And for sure, for-profit entities can play a role. But I think we need to build some new trusted institutions to help do this work. And what could that look like? Well, I think nonprofits are a strong possibility. That's what we're trying to do at ACDDC in Austin. Although when I say we, I'm just a board member. Nicole Jocelyn, our ED, who's in the audience, is the one who really is doing the heavy lifting. Um, but I've come across some other examples too. Pacoima Beautiful is a nonprofit that serves a small, predominantly Latino working class neighborhood in the San Fernando Valley in LA. And they've been engaged in unpermitted ADU issues in, in, in there. Trust South LA has an interesting community land trust model that they're developing linking ADUs to, to single family houses. And Hello Housing in Oakland has an ambitious plan. They want to create a, what they call a one-stop shop, both for homeowners who want to build ADUs and for low-income tenants who are looking to live in them. And I think there could be a role for government too. Dr. Cog, the MPO in Metro Denver, is, is interested in, in this sort of a function. And it sure sounds like Metro here in uh, in the Portland region is doing fantastic work in that regard as well. So whether it's a, a nonprofit or a governmental entity, perhaps a university-run architectural clinic, as the UA, UCLA planning and architecture scholar Vinit Mukija has suggested, or whether it's some other entity, 
There's probably lots of different answers, but the bigger point is that, I, that we're going to need intermediaries. And where they don't exist, we're going to have to create them or convince some existing institution to take on this, this new function. Because simply saying to homeowners, hey, you've got permission to go build a $150,000 ADU. Good luck. I just I don't think that's going to be good enough going forward. Third, uh, I think we really do need public dollars. So to return to that example of the homeowner struggling to stay in her home, who could benefit from having an ADU but who doesn't have the financial capacity to stay, I think we're going to have to find ways to, to mobilize public dollars. The good news, the really good news, is that you can get a lot of bang from your ADU subsidy buck. After all, ADUs are, like I've been saying before, much cheaper than the typical forms of subsidized housing. Now, the last thing I want to do here is pit different forms of affordable housing against each other. They all have their different roles to play. And in my case, before I was a pointy-headed academic, I spent five years developing this sort of housing. And I, it really does a world of good, and, and we need it. But I think cities should broaden what they do and who they help, and that should include helping struggling homeowners. And at ACDDC, in Austin, we're trying to make this case to the city right now. And I think we've got a good sales pitch to elected officials, one that would resonate probably in a lot of cities that, that you all come from. Because remember, elected officials are constantly hearing from constituents who are worried about having to leave their neighborhoods because, because they're gentrifying, because they can't afford to stay in them anymore. And usually all that elected officials have to offer is, we're going to use inclusionary zoning, we're going to take some revenue from a housing trust fund or some other funding mechanism, and we're going to give those funds to a nonprofit who, if all goes well, after five years, will be able to build some low rent income restricted apartments in that neighborhood, which is fantastic. I am not denigrating that in, in the slightest. But from the point of view of the homeowner, the homeowner says, well, that's great, but how's that help me? I need help now. I don't want to leave my home. I can't wait five years. And those new apartments aren't even going to be reserved for me or people like me, right? So you're going to have to kind of throw your name into the lottery like anyone else. So if we can go to a city and say, hey, uh, if you put in 50 grand or 100 grand or whatever the right number is, maybe structured as a low or zero interest loan for the homeowner, maybe something that's not due until the house is sold, we can help this homeowner build an ADU and stay on their property and I think we're actually helping the elected officials solve a political problem that they're facing right now, not just a social justice problem, although it is that too. Fourth, I think we need more partners, and I think we should think expansively about this. There are all sorts of entities out there with a, that with a little bit of creativity might be able to, might have an interest in financially helping homeowners build ADUs. For example, we have lots of university community partnerships in this country. Uh, perhaps most famously at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, with, um, but, but lots of others too. So what if a university, an institution with deep pockets, worked with struggling homeowners, lent them money to build ADUs on very favorable terms, and then said, hey, we'll send you our pre-vetted students to, to, to rent those units. I think that could be a real win-win. Or another possibility could be school districts. Lots of school districts around the country are struggling to hire teachers in places where it's tough to find decent rental housing on a starting salary of, in Austin, I think it's around 40000 a year. You know, try finding decent rental accommodations in central Austin on that amount. So I, I do think we have to think creatively about some new partnerships. And I think some of these might help us reach that scale that we're, that we're all looking for. And then fifth, uh, I, we, we really need to look outside of the US for precedence. Um, in general, in my research in housing policy, I've often found that in housing, we're really inward looking. We talk about the US. Transportation planning, they talk about Bogota and Curitiba and all these other places, but we don't do that as much with housing policy. Um, but as many of you already know, Portland, without a doubt, is the ADU capital of the United States. But Vancouver, 300 miles north of here, is the ADU capital of the North American continent. And uh, there, as you'll hear from uh, Jake Fry of, of Small Works um, in the following uh, panel, uh, they allow two units on each single family lot, which I understand Portland is now considering doing, what they call a secondary suite, which is usually a basement unit, and then also what they call a laneway 
house, which is a detached unit up against the back alley. So Vancouver is seriously stressed by affordability concerns. Clearly, they're not afraid to push the envelope with bold solutions. Um, Edmonton and Calgary and Alberta, I have to give a shout out to Edmonton, that's where I grew up. Uh, but they've been giving grants to homeowners to build ADUs. Unless I'm missing something, I don't think we've done that here in the US up till now. So in Canada, really they're struggling with affordability in their urban areas even more than, than we are. So I think we should be paying close attention to what they're doing. And I would imagine the Brits and the Australians and Latin Americans and various others may have really intriguing models too. So I'll end with a question that is really intended as a provocation, but something that I think people like us, we, we, let's talk about it. You know, I, I don't have the answer, but here's the question. Does an ADU always need to be tied to a main house? Or should we push for the option for it to be decoupled by making it easier for homeowners to subdivide their lots or create a condo regime or whatever? Now, I can see arguments on both sides, to be honest. The argument that the ADU should be accessory to the main house is that this is about creating long-term value for a homeowner. It's about ensuring that homeowners, rather than home builders, are the driving force behind adding ADUs to neighborhoods. But let me tell you the opposing point of view, which is perhaps a more radical point of view. Imagine if single-family homeowners could subdivide their lots just as of right. That would open up a lot of new possibilities. For example, a homeowner could now get a construction loan to build an ADU probably a lot more easily than now because the lender would have some collateral, this, this other lot. Um, or imagine an elderly homeowner who, more than needing an ADU, what they really need is they just need a big chunk of money right now, right? Uh, to install a wheelchair ramp to their house or install ADU, ADA bathrooms in the main house to pay medical bills, to pay home health aides, whatever. If that homeowner could subdivide their lot and sell their backyard to a builder who could build something that quack, quacks like an ADU, that uh, barks like an ADU, but that isn't technically accessory, but that's just a small house on a small lot, perhaps that could be powerful. Of course, you pretty much can't do this in US cities right now, but you know, I'd like to encourage us to, to at least think about it, to, to think through the implications of proposing a more, you could call it radical policy like this. So with all these suggestions, there is a through line, and it's that we, we can't rest on our laurels. We should learn from this false dawn of 80s and 1980s. We should think more expansively and strategically about our efforts now, make sure that our scrappy but now increasingly successful ADU movement doesn't just stay on autopilot. We should be unafraid to be bold and propose big things. After all, if the organizers of this conference hadn't been willing to do that here in Portland, I don't think we'd be all here together today having these fantastically stimulating conversations, which I'm just very excited to have for the rest of the day. So thank you so very much for this honor and invitation.